What a great God we serve. What a great, great God. He's worthy of all praise. He is to be adored by his people. He's kind, loving, peaceful, gentle, merciful, thank God, full of grace. An interview with God. This has been going on for quite some time. It's because God still has more to reveal about himself to us. I like that. He won't let me go. He keeps sharing more and more. And we're just going to see uh, how far we can go with what God wants to share today. An interview with God. Reach your hand this way, please. And let's believe God to anoint today. Most Heavenly Father, we are nothing without you. We don't even exist unless you spoke us into existence. And I thank you that you did. I thank you that you saw promise in us. I'm thankful that you saw greatness in us, Lord, when we saw nothing. Today, God, I ask that you step onto this platform. And Lord, if it be convenient, that you would sit on this makeshift throne that we have tried to present, God, in our best way. And Lord, you'd come and sit with us and dwell with us today. And Lord, let your presence be made known. God, we need you. There's some people here today who need a miracle. Lord, I was sensing it when I was in my office. I know there was things you were showing me that people have got to have today. They're in the right place. We ask, Lord, that you will do for them exactly what they need this hour. Help them to receive your word, we ask. In Jesus' holy, wonderful name we pray. And everyone said together, amen. An interview with God. Our guest today is the most amazing being to have ever existed. Interestingly enough, he has no father and no mother, yet he's got a world full of kids. Isn't that interesting? I'm speaking of God. How do I know that he's here today? I find it from his word as he testifies about himself in Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. I am a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? There's another verse that shows me that the Lord is here. It's found in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of the, of the Spirit, or of God, sorry, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I'll read that one more time. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If you're saved, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Savior, then God's Spirit lives in every one of you. Isn't that exciting? I get on a little high ever so often, not with drugs, but in the Spirit, because I start reminding myself and testifying that God is in me. I got good news for you, believer. God came with you today. He rode in the van, the car, the truck. God came with you, and he resides in your soul right this second. You've been chosen, chosen for greatness, chosen to carry a most holy God. Man, what? A, oh, I just get excited. I can't help it. I love him, and I love the fact that he's in me. Is there a passage, Father, that would closely define you in your scripture? I believe the Lord would lead us to Psalm 113. And here's what we're going to do, because I'm a little different. Everybody, stand up. We're going to start with, from right here's the divider between Matthew and Jesse. From here over, side one. From Matthew over, side two. We're going to alternate verses. We're going to start with side one on verse number one, and we're going to keep alternating. I want to hear you real loud. So here we go. Beginning with verse one. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Here we go, side two. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord, uh-oh, is it not on there? <laughs> they got excited reading. All right, verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. And everyone together, he grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. 
You may be seated. If there was a chapter to describe my daddy, describe your heavenly father and mine, it would be Psalm 113. He is high above all nations. His glory above the heavens. How can a God like that possibly relate to someone like you or me? It's because at the end of that chapter, he said, he raises the poor out of the dust and he lifts the needy. If God is able to lift someone who's in a dark place to a higher place, it tells us that God must therefore be willing to enter a dark place. God must be willing to look down and see you at your worst and to be able to grab hold of you and pull you up to a place that is holy, righteous, pure, and full of joy. God's not afraid of your darkness. God's not afraid of your turmoil. My Lord, I feel him. God's not afraid of your chaos and your destructive patterns that seem to keep guiding you down the wrong way. God's not afraid of getting his hands dirty when he deals with us. Because of that, he is able to leave a throne that is pure, holy, nothing but holiness surrounding him and to enter a realm that is ungodly, unclean, full of flesh and carnality and say, I'll come where you are to pick you up and lift you up where you need to be. I love God. I love the fact that he's willing to do that. You know, I've heard some people say before, well, God... He can't even look on evil and on sin. And I know to an extent that that makes sense. But, you know, as it relates to us, I also see a truth in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah where the, the father came down with some angels. And, and he said, I'm going to see for myself if the report that's came up to heaven is accurate about the sin of those in Sodom and Gomorrah. God was willing to go and enter a place, even though he's holy and he's awesome, and to look upon sin himself to make sure the report that was coming to him was accurate. So that it lets me know that although I don't believe sin could truly last for a, a long time in the ultra presence of God's true glory, I also know that God has a way of covering his glory. And he has a way of masking it temporarily so that he can come and be in our midst without striking us dead. He can come with all of our impurities and, and our failures and our faults and he can enter our midst and we're still able to handle it and to experience joy even though there's still fault in us. Because we love him and because we chose his son to be our savior just as he chose us, God looks at us through eyes of Christ. And he sees through a filter of crimson blood and he knows that we still are imperfect and yet as he looks through the blood of his own son, he says, I know their potential and I know who they're going to become. And one day when I send my son and the, the son calls their names, they will become like me. They'll be purified. They'll be holy just as I'm holy. That is the will of God for you. He's not afraid of your faults. He's not afraid of, of your mistakes. He's not scared he'll, he'll get a little dirty dirt under the fingernails of his holy hand when he comes down and scoops you up out of that mess you got back in again that you've been in before and you said you weren't going to go back there. Can, can I preach for just a second? And you did it anyway and God says, well, I'm not afraid to get a little dirt under my fingernails because by the time I pull you up to where I want you to be, not only will my hands be clean, but you're going to be purified. God loves us. He's got great things in store for us. What can you, Father, offer humanity today? Galatians 5, 22 through 23, he offers us the fruit of the Spirit. I wish somehow that I could take this church in the spirit realm and we could go to the produce aisle of heaven this morning. I know that sounds a little funny, but I'm being very serious. I wish I could hand every one of you a basket or maybe you'd want a cart. You might want enough to take home to the whole family. And we could stroll down the produce aisle of glory and find out that there's been some fruit that's been missing in us. See, sometimes, sometimes I preach to myself while I'm preaching to you. See, the Lord's trying to show us that... Uh, in order to accomplish the mission, there's got to be more peace. There's not enough peace. Look at that, that beautiful red apple. 
And it makes me think, as I can see my reflection in it, that God's a God of love. He's a God who loved you enough to send his only begotten son that you could have eternal life. I stroll a little bit farther down and I see gorgeous glowing oranges. When I see that, I, I can't help but think of joy, Brother Randall. See, it's so amazing how many times we let the, whether it's the devil or circumstances or our own goofy minds, mess us up to a point where we lose all our joy. Church, we got to get back on the produce aisle of glory. We got to find that joy that's been lost for too long. It's been some of us so tore up and tormented and going through junk and it's not fair and we're, we're mad about it, we're upset or maybe things didn't pan out the way we thought they should. The Bible tells us weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. I stroll and I see something that's a favorite fruit, Brother Randy, of monkeys. They love those bananas. Hey, I'm right there with them. I'll swing with the best of them. Hallelujah. Peel me a good old ripe banana and eat that thing. I'll put, I'll cut up some banana and stick it on a, a couple of slices of bread with peanut butter. And I, I fix me a peanut butter banana sandwich and a bowl of hot chili. Man, y'all, y'all thinking, man, this pastor's getting out there. Lord, help him get back in the south. I am in the south. I look at the beautiful bananas and as I peel them, I can't help but I can't help but be reminded that there's been times where it seemed like Colton there was zero hope. Zero hope. There was no way things were going to turn out good. As I walk and the father puts his hand on our heads as we push the buggy. I says you just remember Remember Michael, remember Gary, remember Hope, Randall. Remember Neil and Gerilyn, that I've always got hope for you. Remember that there's always a blessed hope. I don't care how bad it looks or how impossible it seems. I've still got hope. You've still got hope. See, God's taking New Haven down the produce aisle today. He's trying to show us there's been some fruit missing from us. I go a little farther, and there's one that I don't really like to deal with, Father, and I wish you'd let me pass it up. And He says, no. No, you've got to pick up this fruit, Michael. Because if you don't, your basket will be incomplete. I look a little closer, and I hold that thing in my hand and it's, it's, I have to have two hands because it's so heavy. It's, it's almost like a burden. In the natural, we'd call it a watermelon. That sucker, they can get big and heavy like a pumpkin. And it's not fun to juggle it around and sometimes when you lean over and put it in the buggy, you're almost afraid. Now, somebody relates to me right here. You're afraid you might pull something. Because it's heavy and you try to be careful, bend the knees a little, Brother Jim, when you put that watermelon in that basket. You say, what's that watermelon? That's a fruit of self-control. Gets a little heavy. Gets hard to deal with. I don't like it. I like being able to get my way when I want it, how I want it. Have it your way, church. That's not what God's word says. It's have it his way. Amen. But when I place that gigantic watermelon of self-control in the basket, it reminds me it's going to take some work. I can't pick it up like I can the apple and just take a big old bite. You'd get uh, the rind and the, the tough part. You wouldn't enjoy that one bit. See, it takes a knife. It takes a sword of the Spirit to start cutting through that thick outer coating and that, that uh, protective cover that God placed on it to protect that juicy, red, delicious watermelon uh, taste on the inside. But once I get through it all the way, I notice there's something of a reddish color in it. And when I cut it up, and, and you know, the Bible says you are the salt of the earth. And I'm going to tell you right now, watermelon's a little weird without salt to me. I like putting on some salt if I'm going to eat it. So I add a little bit of the salt of the earth as my witness of who I am because of Christ. And then I take that and I, I am reminded... 
It wasn't easy getting to where I am right now. It wasn't easy to step over what, when I felt uh, disrespected. I hope that's the right way of saying that. I don't know. Disrespected, is that right? When I felt disrespected, when I felt like people weren't showing me the, the uh, respect they should have, it was hard cutting through that outer tough skin. But when I was able to uh, maintain self-control, control my mouth, control my tongue, control my thoughts, I'm going to tell you right now, I told Brother Gary last week, it was like an onslaught of Satan getting ready to go and, and meet with the football team at the school. It was like an onslaught of Satan on my mind. And the enemy was coming and hitting me with crazy stuff. I'd lay awake at night just thinking stuff... Never has happened, never will happen. But it was just like a movie. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, a player in this movie, and I'm doing all kind of crazy stuff. I'm like, this is crazy. The enemy was coming after my mind. God was trying to promote that fruit of self-control within me and to realize that I had the ability to rebuke the devil, and he would flee. Same applies to all of us. You have the power, if you are a Christian, you're saved by the blood of the Lamb, you've got the power to take out that sword of the Spirit and say, no longer, no longer hot temper, no longer uh, uh, a person who I've become, uh, am I going to allow you to dictate my thoughts and my actions? I will be a child of self-control. I will turn over my members to the Holy Ghost. When I feel like saying something I shouldn't, I'm going to shut my mouth and let God speak over me. When somebody attacks me, instead of coming back and cursing them, out and beating them in the face with my knuckles I'll say I love you God loves you I pray the Lord will help you out of your mess but I'm going to intercede for you until you turn around self control brother Neil when you're on the highway and somebody gets in front of you going 20 in a 45 mile per hour zone and you want to turn into a bulldozer and round them off that sanctified road when you get self control and say dear God help me right now I'm mad I'm angry I'm in a hurry quick note here Colton leave a little earlier than you think it'll take you to get there and that might help you that's amazing how that helps with self control when you're not in a hurry when you've got 10 minutes to spare you can get old well oh man my wife's a grandmother so I guess I can say this and get away with it I was going to say let an old granny get in front of you I'm, a, I'm an old grandpa let an old grandpa get in front of you and if you got 10 minutes to spare, you won't lose it. Amen? You won't lose it when every red light gets the spirit of the devil in it and catches you all the way from here to Gadsden. It won't bother you. you matter of fact, you'll say, I got time, Brother Randall. I'm going to use this to praise my God. I'm at a red light. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at somebody and smile. They're looking like, I'm five minutes late. You're over there saying, praise God, I left early. Woo, hallelujah. This is what it's like when you leave early and you get up out of that bed. Hallelujah. Give people a, a wave. Let God's Spirit work through you through kindness. Amen. There's a lot of fruit that God is wanting to remind us of today. And our buggy's gotten empty. And we've passed it and we said me and Brother Jim was going to go to the steak aisle. And we was going to pick us up some T-bones and get some potatoes. But, but God was saying, but before you got to that steak, there was some fruit on that produce aisle that you forgot, you left behind. There was meat, my God, I'm, I'm preaching right now. There's some meat that I wanted to get into, God. I wanted great revelation, and my Lord, I feel him now, Ben, something's happening. I, there was revelation that I wanted. And I just wanted more of God, more of God, more of God, and God said, I'll give you more of me, but here's the problem. You're seeking revelation so much that you've bypassed the fruit of the Spirit, and now, you, my God, help me, now you get revelation revelation and you get up under the anointing and nobody listens to you because you don't have the fruit to back it up when it's the normal day my lord steak is good and it smells good on the grill but you get somebody with an ugly attitude that just because they get up in their ministry and all of a sudden they change, and, oh, I'm anointed now. You've got to respect me. I'm going to speak, preach, teach, sing. No, we do not have to re respect somebody who ain't got one piece of fruit in their life. Get the fruit of the Spirit and you'll gain the respect of the church. I've told people many times I'd much rather be around a minister who was humble than a minister who had, who had a great anointing to preach. I want both when, I, when I'm around people and when we have ministers in the church, I want both. But what I really want is someone who's humble, someone who's meek, 
Someone who doesn't try to have their way and push everybody else out of the way and say, this is what I'm hearing from the Lord. You're wrong. You're not hearing from God. Sit down, shut that mouth, and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. I would rather have 50 people who are humble than 50 people who are gifted in all kind of gifts and can't sit down and shut up when it's time to follow order in the church. Amen. Now, here's the good news. That's what we got. Praise the Lord. I'm not wishful thinking here. We've got that. We've got people who will honor the Spirit. I'm not beating y'all up today. I'm just telling you that I'm thankful that God has given you wisdom, that you, and, 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 and I know God's working on some people or else I wouldn't even have gotten completely off the message. Amen, Matthew? I wouldn't have got completely off the message. He's like, man, I done lost place. I don't know where he is. But it's because God's saying, revisit the produce aisle. Go back to the fruit. Quit worrying about deep revelation and get back in get back in love, somebody. Get back into loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, before you spend 14 hours in the Word trying to get the coolest uh, thought for your class and your church that nobody's ever got before. You want to become another Perry Stone, Dr. Perry Stone. Before you seek those awesome deep gifts, put your hand out in the foyer, shake somebody's hand and say, I love you and so does God. Before you get up here and you pitch your Holy Ghost fits doing 15 circles and a backflip while, while you're in the middle of your special, make sure you go up to someone who's looking kind of down and instead of blowing by them because you're too anointed and God's got you too focused on your ministry in the church, how about stopping and talking to somebody in the hallway and saying, is there something going on with you? Is, is, there, a, uh, is there a crisis in your life? Is, is there something I need to stop and pray with you about? Yeah, I've got something I need to be doing in the next five minutes, but I've got 30 seconds to grab you by the hand and pray with you because we're a family here and we love one another and it's not about some super anointing or putting on the best show it's about becoming one in the spirit uniting and loving people fruit fruit tastes so good don't it it tastes so good but sometimes brother randy it takes so long to obtain it i think about the apple tree and how it starts with a seed and it gets planted in the ground and man you're sitting there for a few years thinking oh boy i can't wait to see those delicious red apples and finally it begins to produce but if you mess with it too quick, you'll ruin it. If you go to picking things off too soon, you won't ever get the right delicious red apples that God's got for you in the spirit. So we can't rush what God's doing. I told uh, a, a brother this past week, and I know I'm, just, I'm all over the place today, but I'm just going to follow the Lord. I told him I got all in a tizzy <laughs> about a certain open door with the Southside High School. And it fell through. I sent out an email this past Thursday. I got double booked. I didn't get to speak. I woke up that morning. It was about 5.15. I was Colton. I was like, Lord, I think you're going to anoint. You're going to move today. And then I got a call about 8 o'clock from a good friend of mine. He said, they've double booked. I'm sorry. I, I was clear with them that you were coming today and it, something happened. And I got upset. And I, I told the brother, I said, well, I said, according to the scripture, all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to are called according to his purpose. So I said, I know it's going to work out. But I was upset. Figured the devil was in it. <laughs> but it wasn't the devil. The Lord revealed something to me. He revealed while I was sitting at count meeting in June that he didn't show me going up and talking to some chaplain over the school. He didn't show me trying to get open doors through people where I would make it happen. He showed me sitting in the office of the principal and directly talking to the head over the entire school. I had gotten distracted. I'm still going to go this Thursday and speak with the football team. Praise God. I'm looking forward to that. And it, it, God is going to use it as an open door. But what God started showing me was, get back to what I told you. You're all excited because somebody supposedly is going to open up mega doors for you. And it may never even happen, but if you'll follow the pattern I showed you, I'll make it happen. Amen. So I called that very day, and I talked to the, the principal, called me back the next day, and he said, I'd be glad to meet with you. So I've got a meeting with him this coming week. And I'm going to share with him what God has told me to say. And I'm believing, because I'm obeying and not getting excited about some other doors, that I'm obeying what God showed me, that this is going to be the beginning of some wonderful things with our connection with the school. He is a believer. The principal is a Christian. 
loves the Lord. But we've got to make sure we follow what the Lord's plan is instead of getting in a hurry. Fruit takes a while to produce. There's things that God showed me around, I guess it's around 2009. I've shared this, I believe, with you. But I remember seeing from one side of a church to another, children under the age of 13, they were 12 and under, just as, well, it's probably 50 feet across. And I remember seeing them being saved, being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. I said, Lord, I thought it was within that year I would see it. Well, it hadn't happened yet because God was putting a seed in me. Because as the moments get closer and when we get to that point and we see that moment, God's going to remind me. Now, remember five, six years ago what I showed you. It was because I wanted to prepare your heart for this. The revival we've seen that's going to happen in schools with young people falling down beside their desk, crying out that you've heard me pray about so many or preach about so many times. It didn't happen the first year we came like I expected. God was planting seeds. God said, you preach it. You plant it before I'll bring it to pass. I've got to have word to work with before faith can arise. So we planted word and we spoke by faith things that seemed absolutely impossible. I told him last night, I said, God, since you showed me that, an entire group of young people has already went through Southside High and graduated. I didn't understand it. But it's because God was showing me four years ahead that he was planting something that it would take a while to germinate. That there had to be seed planted before fruit could be produced. So God said, I want New Haven to head back to the produce aisle. Quit worrying about the steaks and baked potatoes and the big yeast rolls. Gigantic ice cold sweet tea. And he said, get back to my fruit. It's not always easy to get to the core of it, but it's going to be worth the effort. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. I want you to picture every time I read one of these words, you're picking it up off the shelf and you're putting it in your buggy. Long-suffering. Kindness. God, give us kindness. Goodness. Where you just naturally want to do good things for somebody. It's not about how it benefits you at all. You're good because you want to do good like your daddy does. You want to treat people right like Heavenly Father treats you. Put your hand back on the shelf and find faithfulness. When you commit to do something in the church, you are to be faithful and see it through. You don't quit early. You don't give up. You don't say, well, I'm I'm through. I'm finished. I just don't think I can handle it. God's going to give you the grace to see through what you have committed to. Be faithful. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such, there is no law. What else can you offer humanity, Father? He would tell us today in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I remember my wife telling me a story of a particular time in her life where she needed peace and she earnestly prayed and sought the Lord and she said it was so real to her that it felt like God was placing a coat or a garment covering over her she could literally feel it as if you had come up and put a physical uh, cloak over her God's peace is real church there's a peace that surpasses all understanding have you ever experienced that Has anybody in this room ever felt that peace of God that you knew was not of this world? It went beyond anything that a counselor, a drug, anything could do to possibly help you through a situation. It was the peace that surpasses all understanding. God's peace is a lot like a growing tree. I want to read this to you. In the early stages, the roots dig deep while a stem grows out of the ground. The stem is very flexible. The person who planted the tree, which is represented by God, understands that strong winds will come, but the stem of the tree will bend with the winds. So he allows the tree to be blown to and fro, just like he has many of us when we first came to God. And we were young and vibrant and flexible, and things would hit us and we'd bounce right back. It's because God knew that we could handle the wind. 
Later, the tree grows taller and stronger, and the trunk become, begins to thicken as leaves continue to appear. Somebody, please be in prayer right now. Fall comes and the leaves turn, allowing the planter to enjoy the colorful portrait painted by the tree. <clears throat> but then winter comes. Instead of uprooting the tree and placing it in a warm green room, the planter of the tree allows the tree to experience a type of death because of winter cold. The cold weather forces the tree to turn inward and use nutrients from its roots. Listen to this. According to northernwoodlands.com, a tree staves off freezing or holds off freezing. This is very interesting. By sweetening the fluids within the living cells of the tree. By autumn time, a tree converts starches to sugars, which act as antifreeze. Isn't that interesting? The starches within the tree become sugars, so they can act as antifreeze inside the tree. The cellular fluid within the living cells becomes concentrated with these natural sugars, which lowers the freezing point inside the cells, while the sugar-free water between the cells is allowed to freeze. Because the cell membranes are more pliable in winter, they're squeezed but not punctured by the expanding ice crystals. Brilliant creator our God is. He made a tree so that it could withstand winter by forcing its sugars and starches to, to harden to a point of becoming like antifreeze that you put in your vehicle. Now what does this have to do with us? We are that tree. We're the tree that was young and bendable, flexible at the beginning. And over time, we became stronger, but at the same time of being stronger, we were also hardened by life. And there were situations that forced us almost to form an, a hard outer shell. We didn't really want it. When we were young, we never imagined becoming like that, but because of life and rigid weather, we were forced to form that hard shell. Storms came at times, and Sometimes we felt like we were struck by lightning and it hit our limbs. And you know this probably that someone who watches over a tree, if a lightning bolt hits a limb, that they'll often look and if there's a dead part, they'll try to cut it off before that rot and that deadness reaches the core and the root system of the tree. Life has come and hit many of us right in the face. And during this entire process, We've often looked up to the heavens and said, God, why are you letting me feel this way? Why are you letting me get hit with this? Why is it that I've lost control of what I thought I was in control of? Why, Lord, has something been stripped away from me that I thought I would have for life? Why? Why? It's during this process that the gardener, that the father is stepping back, and instead of intervening every time you think you've got to have a miracle, the Father's saying, but this is what's going to make you stronger. This will make you who I want you to be. It's not going to cause you to become so hardened that you turn your back on me and you backslide and give up on me. No, I'm allowing this because I know what you can handle, and I won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to overcome. Therefore, if you're tempted, I've already made a way of escape. That's the word of the Father today. We are that tree. But some people would look to me today and they'd say, but pastor, I feel like I've been through a lot more than just winter. I've been through more than being struck by a lightning bolt and hit from my blind side, not expecting it. I've experienced more than a forest fire where it touched a lot of people around me and a lot of people were affected and so was I. It's been worse than that. I feel as if someone has taken an ax <clears throat> with their words, with their actions, with the way they treat me. And they've taken an ax and they have hit my roots, hit the lower part of the trunk. They've, they've tried to take me down from below because they knew if the lower part, my foundation was attacked, then my whole being would be fallen and crushed. I wasn't meant to go through this. I was meant to be beautiful produce fruit I was meant to be grand and rise above the forest for people to be able to see my potential but yet folks came and attacked me and they came after my trunk 
and they hit me where I wasn't expecting and, and I thought I had fortified myself enough to where I'd be strong enough to handle it but I, I wasn't and now pastor they've hit me where it hit or, or hurt the worst and they've attacked the trunk so what do you do when you feel like that your tree has fallen oh it's more drastic than than a few branches broken because of wind what do you do when you feel like you've been cut down you conduct an interview with God and you come up to his throne and you say father what do you have to say to me because you know where I am God would turn in his holy word to the book of Job chapter 14 verse 7 and this is what he sent me to tell somebody today mm, thank you spirit of the living God Lord thank you for making us pliable to hear you for there is hope for a tree if it is didn't say blown over did it didn't say if it lost a few limbs if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its tender shoots will not cease messages like this don't always relate to everybody because a lot of people are doing great they're on fire for the Lord God's moving they're, they're accomplishing great things that's wonderful that's where you need to be but sometimes God steps into a service and he says but I, I want to deal with some broken folks see the, the the well are not the ones who need the physician it's the sick that's what the Bible says Jesus didn't come to deal with all the well folks he came to deal with those who needed him God came in this building this morning to deal with somebody who needs him somebody who needs him for there is hope blank that's where you put your name for there is hope when I say that, for there is hope, right after that, I want you to say your name out loud. And, and we're just going to read that entire verse. Here we go. For there is hope, Michael. I heard maybe about three or four. There's a lot more hope than that. All right, let me get back here where I can hear you a little better. I want to hear you say your name. I want to hear some. Some of you got some cool names. Some of you got some funny ones. I want to hear them all. Here we go. For there is hope. Michael, for a tree. Let's keep reading together. If it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. When a tree is cut down, there are no tender shoots. It's just a stump. So you know what that means? God says, I'm going to cause something to grow from you where it looked dead. I'm going to cause life to be resurrected in you where you feel so dried up and so chopped down and so cut down. Stand with me, church. Whoever the Lord's speaking to today, this has been an encouraging message for you. God's not through. He said, you may feel chopped down, cut down, cut off from life source. But Sister Deborah, I love this thought. You keep worshiping. But I love this thought that you can cut a tree down, but the roots still have access to the nutrients in the water. I mean, from the top level, it can look dead, gone. There ain't no more hope. But there's still roots that you can't see, you can't get to with that ax. And it's reaching deeper. It's saying, all right, you cut me down, I'll go deeper this time. You, you talked about me, I'll fight harder this time. Not against you, but against uh, principalities, powers of darkness of the air. Uh, you, you've, you tried to ruin my reputation? Well, I'll just go a little deeper and get closer to Jesus. You broke my heart? I'll just get more in love with him. And as you let go of bitterness and unforgiveness and anger, let go of the past, God says, I'm going to bring tender shoots. I said, God can't stand looking at you and you being dried up and unproductive. He put too much in you. My Lord, I'm talking to somebody. He put too much in you for you to sit there and die and not be productive anymore. He, he said, I'm I've still got life in you. Your root system has not been affected. You still know the word. You, you still have connection with me. You can still call my name and I'll answer you and I'll love you and I'll touch you again and I'll cause you to 
give birth to fruit again because I haven't given up on you. I love you. I love you. He said, I love you. You're not dead. If you were, you wouldn't even feel him touching you right now. This morning, I called the church to prayer so that everyone will feel welcome. Everybody in this church, please, if you can find a place in the altar, I'd love to see you praying up here with me. If you can't fit up here, find another place in the church. But I want you to bring your root system. Say, God, I'm willing to dig deeper this time. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to lose hope. My God, I'm going to dig deeper. And I'm going to get more in love with you than I've been because I've missed you. I've missed your presence. I've missed feeling the sunshine hit a leaf on my branch and seeing it bloom. And feeling the raindrops of the latter day rain touching my limbs and causing me to be refreshed. I've missed that, Lord. Everyone, please come up. I'm not just speaking to those that the Lord's talking to. I want everybody. Let's pray.